because they say, don't touch me. You don't touch them. What's that referred to? What? Well, it's not getting sued, but why do you get sued? Not getting consent. They didn't give you consent. This is big stuff, guys. This is one of those things that gets you in trouble real fast. If they say, don't touch me, okay, you know, uh, what, what happened and talk with them, you know, what hurts, what, what happened here, you can ask questions and stuff. But if they say, don't touch me, don't touch them. Go ahead and call an EMS, don't touch them, okay? And you will have some individuals that may not want to be touched. Our oldest daughter was playing soccer years ago, and this one young lady was running down the field, and she hyperextended her knee. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was out. It was a cool fall day, and it had been raining, so the ground was wet. And she's laying on the ground with this dislocated knee, ran out there to try to help, and all she would say, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Let me put something on you because the ground's wet and getting <clears throat> cold. Don't touch me. Did it make any sense? We think about it and say, no, it really didn't make any sense. Let us help you here. But to her, don't touch me. EMS came and they talked her into it and they got her and she was, she was okay to her on this. Introduce yourself, tell them you're training first day, tell them you can help them. You check for level of consciousness. Yes. Is there an age on that? Like can the parents be like, you can help her? You could, but the parents are uh, granting consent at that point. The other thing is that if an individual is unconscious, do you have to get consent from that person? No. You can't. So it's assumed that if they were conscious, they would agree to let you help them. On that, yes. What's the age limit the parents can't give consent? Is it 16 or not? That's probably statutory. It's 18 in most states. There's some, a few states, very few states, but usually it's considered to be 18. At 18, you're an adult and you make your own decisions. Parents can give consent before that, but again, uh, another thing that you need to take into consideration is the age of the individual. Um, as you get older, you know more, you understand things, you can accept more responsibility, even though you may not be 18 years old. So that plays into the factor as well. It's kind of, it's not cut and dry, it's not black and white. So mo in most cases, in most cases, people are going to let you help on that. Okay. Um, level of consciousness. The individual may be totally aware and able to communicate with you and answer questions. Uh, it may be obvious that they're in pain, but they're there, okay? You may have an individual who's kind of loopy, and you ask a question, and it's like, whoa. I had a soccer player one time that uh, took a shot to the head, and when he got hit in the head, he hit the ground. I mean, he was just, bam, on the ground. Official ran over to him. Official was close by. Official ran over, ran over to him. The kid was kind of sitting up on the ground at that point. And the official held up three fingers. How many fingers do you see? His answer was, Mama, is that you? The kid was conscious but he wasn't fully conscious. So you may get all kinds of answers. The individual may be on drugs. The individual may have a head injury. There may be some type of medication or, uh, that the individual has responded to in such a way that they're not totally there. So determine the level of consciousness. Dr. Kerry? Yes. I, I looked this up uh, in my preparations for my and I did know that somebody that's inebriated or intoxicated mm -hmm. or under um, drugs, yeah, uh, it's automatically assumed that consent would be provided. They would want their he your help. 
If. And so, yes, if in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. So as a first aid provider, if you'll feel comfortable rendering aid, you can assume, and, and even with a disabled person. Yeah. Uh, the other thing was, uh, I looked up whether or not coaches and travel ball, if the parents are there, what do you do? The coach becomes the legal guardian in the instance of a 12 or a 14 year old. I who have children wanted to know that. So if a parent is not available, but the coach or the trainers are there, they become the legal guardian who grant consent. So in that case, the coach, if the coach or the, or the, the trainer wasn't able to render the aid and you were, they have the legal authority to grant consent. Yeah, and that's, you'll run across this term. You probably get this in your legal class in loco parente, which means in place of parent. So you, if you're working with a youth team or something like that, and the parents aren't there, you are there in place of the parent. So there's additional responsibility that goes with that. Um, assess the breathing. How are they breathing? Is it normal breathing? Is it labored breathing? Assess the breathing. Check for bleeding. Now, this is not a scratch or a scrape. This is where you would have heavy bleeding. If there's heavy bleeding, you need to control that immediately. One of the interesting things is, and, and it's in the material on CPR, they don't talk about bleeding a lot. But if you have an individual who is, has a severe injury and they're bleeding either internally or externally, but especially externally, and you're performing CPR on that individual, they're gonna bleed out on you. Doesn't matter how well you do CPR. So controlling heavy bleeding is very important. So check the individual, scan their body, look to see is there heavy bleeding? Again, we're not talking about a scratch or a scrape or a little cut, but we're talking something where the blood is pumping out. Take care of that. If you don't, anything else you do may not matter at all. Look at the color of their skin, their face. Bluish color would indicate lack of oxygen. Reddish would indicate going into shock. So look at the color of their skin. Uh, if you have an individual, dark-skinned individual, it may be difficult to get a color for their skin. Here's an easy way to check to see if you've got circulation. One, you look at the palm of the hands, that may work for you, but here's one I want you to try right now. I want you to take your index finger, I want you to take your thumb, your index finger, the other hand, and I want you to mash your nail. Look at it. Take, it, take your finger off. You see it change color? You mash it, goes white, take it off, and you see the blood flow come back in. So you can check to see if there's blood flow there. It's another way of doing it. So check for the color of their skin. Check the temperature of the individual. Take the wrist, or excuse me, your wrist, back of your wrist, put it on their forehead to see if they're hot, see if they're cold, may have a fever, may be um, suffering from a cold. Check it out. If you think there's a major problem at this point, then you go ahead and activate EMS. So this is for an individual that's responsive. Check the scene, tell them who you are, that you're there and you can provide first aid, check for level of consciousness, check for breathing, assess their breathing, look for heavy bleeding. If you find any, go ahead and take care of that. Check the color of their face, their skin, Check the temperature, and if you feel it's warranted, go ahead and activate EMS. And that's a primary assessment for a responsive person. Okay? You got that? You can remember that because there's going to be some test questions that deal with that particular material right there. Okay? You're going to have your partner again, and this time we're going to look at. Choking for a responsive individual. In your text, it also talks about choking for a non-responsive individual, but we're not gonna cover that because we'll cover that in a couple of weeks when we do CPR. So I need a partner. Come on. You can sit and watch this one, and then when you uh, get ready to perform it with your partner, you guys can get up and move. So the first thing you're gonna do the individual, you're choking. Choke. Okay? The other thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
He's choking. The other thing that they will usually do is they'll start grabbing their throat because they're trying to get something unlodged here so they can breathe. Are you choking? Okay. Now that you say, relax. You say that's a stupid question. Well, you need to find out what you're dealing with. If the individual says, "Yeah, I, I got something in my throat," what's going on? They're still getting air. They're still breathing. If they're not getting air, they're not talking. Okay. So are you choking? Okay. You position yourself behind the victim. This is going to be a little touchy-feely, so let's don't have any snickering and acting silly about this. Let's get on with the program. You're going to reach around the body, and you want to find the navel. Okay? If you don't find the navel, you're going to end up putting your hand in the wrong place. If you'll reach up to your chest right now, run your finger down your breastbone, you will feel a little tip, bony tip on the end of that. That's the xiphoid process. Now, if you get your hand up on that and you start thrusting on it, you might just break the tip of that xiphoid process off. And that's not going to be a good thing. So if you find the belly button, find the navel, there it is. We've got a reference point. You take your other hand and you make a fist. Keep your hands up and show okay. <laughs> <laughs> Make a fist. You put your fist right above your hand. Right there's the belly button, it's right above the belly button. Turn the thumb in. Take your hand, put it over that one, and don't thrust on this because this person's not really choking, but you want to pull in and up, in and up toward the diaphragm. <laughs> and each time you do that, you want to do it with enough force that hopefully you pop whatever it is out of the throat. Okay? So in real life, would you be like full go? We'll go. Now what you have to do, whatever air is left in the lungs, you're going to be pushing up on the diaphragm. And you push up on the diaphragm, that's going to push that air in the lungs and force it up, and hopefully it'll pop out what's in there. Okay? And one other thing I'm going to tell you in preparation for week after next. The other thing that you can do when you get behind the individual is take one leg and put it right here. Put it between your legs. Now that doesn't mean a thing right now. But this person, if we can't get whatever it is unlodged, eventually that person's going to pass out. And when they do, they're going to collapse. And when they do, then knuckle your legs. Buckle your legs. There you go. Now I've got my leg in here so I can control him and get him down without him falling. And now I've got him down, and now I can begin CPR. Okay? If you're standing back like this and they fall, you're going to take all that weight. So get that leg in there so if they fall, you can support with that leg. Get your partner.